This episode of the Future of Work podcast is brought to you by ServiceNow. Today's workforce expects consumer-grade service experiences, but HR is too busy manually responding to repetitive employee inquiries, leading to lengthy resolution times and frustrated workers. With ServiceNow, you make service delivery more efficient for HR and provide fast, personalized employee service, even for cases that require action from other departments. This year, Forbes also named ServiceNow the world's number one most innovative company. I've also personally known Pat Waters, who's the chief talent officer at ServiceNow for several years, and I'm always impressed and inspired by the work she's doing in the HR space. According to their CEO, John Donahoe, not only is ServiceNow helping to make the world of work work better for people, but they're leading by example in using their own technology and platform to drive a truly digital and employee-centric experience within their organization. You can learn more by visiting servicenow.com forward slash HR. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter to get access to the podcast episodes right when they are released, along with transcripts, free training videos I create, and a bunch of other fun stuff. You can do that at thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. We are an elevator company first and foremost that is aspiring to be a digital industrial company. And these mechanics are our are, are forward line, our forward family who are going to help us get there. So we owe them skills, upskilling, and we owe them technology to be able to do this. And fairly quickly and rapidly, we've been deploying to our mechanics iPhones with specially created apps to help them become more efficient, more effective, to be able to diagnose problems quicker, to be able to order parts while they're actually at the site because they have remote access through these iPhones, to be able to share amongst themselves to help each and every one of them upskill. That's Judy Marks, president at Otis Elevator Company, a 165-year-old organization with over 68,000 employees in almost every country on the planet. They help move, get this, over 2 billion people a day, and chances are that you have ridden either one of their elevators, escalators, or moving walkways, and most of you listening to this podcast do so on a daily basis. Behind this great company is Judy Marks, who was also the former CEO of Siemens in the United States, and prior to that, she spent over 10 years at Lockheed Martin in various roles, including VP of Strategy and Business Development in the Electronic Systems Business Area. Today, our fascinating discussion touches on the role of AI and data, how Otis is upskilling their employees, including their mechanics, trends Judy is paying attention to, how she became the CEO of Otis, and much more. Towards the end of the podcast, I also got the opportunity to ask Judy some of your questions, which were posted on social media. Number one, we celebrate imagination, which means we encourage new thinking and smart risk taking because we started the industry and we absolutely have to drive innovation forward. Number two, and this is that family, we believe in us. We empower and inspire each other through support, through autonomy and through trust, because everyone's primarily out in the field. Number three were many voices. The greatest ideas come from diverse teams of thinkers with different points of view. We are part of every culture, every country we're in. We are local, we look like the country we're in, we act like the country we're in, and we speak like the country we're in. Number four, we're better together. We align as one team, and collaborate to serve our customers. And the last, we strive to be the best. We set big goals, we rise to achieve them, and we win together as a team. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing, 
and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit thefutureorganization.com. If you get a few seconds, please rate the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. It really helps the show and I personally appreciate it since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you are interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Lastly, I launched a new community called The Future If, which is a network of business leaders, authors, and futurists, some of whom are podcast guests, who explore what our future can look like if certain technologies, ideas, approaches, and trends actually happen. Each week, we explore a new topic, which ranges from autonomous vehicles, AI and automation, leadership and management, biohacking, and anything and everything in between. If you want help figuring out hype from reality and are interested in having deeper conversations about the future, then I encourage you to visit thefutureif.com. Thanks for coming along on this journey, and I hope you enjoy the Future of Work podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest today is Judy Marks, president at Otis Elevator Company and former CEO of Siemens in the United States. Judy, thanks for joining me. Jacob, I'm delighted to be here. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we actually first got connected via LinkedIn, right? I I think either I commented on something that you were writing or vice versa, and then we got to talking from that. Is is that how it happened? We did, actually. I commented on something you were talking about in terms of the future of the workforce and how to keep them engaged. And it's a little bit of a passion of mine, and especially with this leading this industrial icon. So we got engaged, and uh, you interviewed me for some as, as one of many leaders for one of your future books. Yes, for the new book that's coming out next year. So LinkedIn, uh, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, well, to get started... Um, Maybe you can give us a little bit of background information about you and how you got to where you are to being the president of Otis Elevator Company. I'd be happy to. So I am um, an engineer by background and a technologist by choice. And I have spent now almost 35 years being able to uh, apply those passions with also trying to excel customer Uh, a customer satisfying customers as well as motivate and lead large groups of employees throughout the globe to be able to meet those objectives. And how did you start off? I mean, you you started off uh, at Siemens uh, and and before that you were at Lockheed. Uh, You were kind of in the in the talent space before that, weren't you? No, actually, I started in the technology space for IBM in 1984 as a systems engineer. Wow, 84. (laughs) Do you remember 1984, Jacob? uh, That was a a good year, yes. (laughs) It was was a good year for both of us. And I just had a great opportunity to do um, for the IBM Federal Systems Company at the time, be able to um, provide engineering solutions uh, that really helped our country and and allies of our country. And so those mission critical systems were what got me, continued to get me excited about applying technology in a very different time when, you know, the PC had just come out a year or two before that. And we were going through what I would tell you is one of many waves of changing roles, responsibilities, the application of technology to solving problems, as well as just watch. I've watched the revolution. I've lived it for almost 35 years, and it's been it's been incredible. And I hope to continue living it. It's funny that you mentioned IBM because uh, a couple podcast guests that I've had who are senior leaders at global companies now, quite a few of them have said that they actually worked at IBM in the 80s. And uh, Maynard Webb is the most recent one. Uh, His podcast hasn't gone live yet, but he was the former chairman of the board of directors of of Yahoo. And he was telling me about his time at IBM also, I think in 83, he said. And uh, it seems like that place has kicked start a lot of uh, careers for people. 
And how did you kind of rise up through the ranks to become the CEO of Siemens and then the president of Otis Elevator? Did, did you do something special? Was it just hard work? Well, hard work is uh, is the most fundamental that I can tell you. And it doesn't stop as you continue to move up in your career. Uh, you just get to, to practice it far more often uh, around the globe at all hours. Um, I would tell you I was always very collaborative and, and people-focused and always tried to understand really what different objectives were for different stakeholders. So, you know, as I moved into some of my first early leadership activities, it was understanding, you know, how could we get work done? How could you delegate effectively as well as developing people around you to coalesce and form a team to solve an objective? You know, I grew up in, in retail. My father was in retail, so I, I always understood the value of a customer. And, you know, here at Otis, we have a lot of customers globally, as you can imagine. Um, you know, we support and service two million elevators uh, around the world every day. We're the largest uh, number one company that does that. And that means we deal with a lot of customers and we need to keep them satisfied day after day. So I would tell you it's it's hard work. It's a, an absolute focus on customers. Uh, and the other thing I would offer for people listening is, um, you know, you have to f- know what your values are and stay true to them. And so always doing the right thing, making sure there's ethics and integrity in everything you're doing. To me, those are just foundational. And then on top of that, you can put your technology and your, your, your ability to solve problems, your ability to work with people. But when you're dealing with, you know, a global environment like we are at Otis, um, there's certain things that are sacrosanct. And I would tell you, you know, staying true to your values is just really sacrosanct to our culture. Well, you started talking a little bit about Otis, so maybe we can talk a little bit more about the company uh, because I'm sure a lot of people uh, are using Otis products and not even realizing they are. Um, so how, how big is the company? How many employees do you guys have? And uh, maybe a little bit of background around the different uh, products that you guys create. Otis is the company that in 1853 basically invented, Elijah Graves Otis invented the safety elevator. So we are a company that has evolved through 165 years. And I'm just proud to say I'm one of 68,000 colleagues now who are delivering leading edge products and services in over 200 countries and territories around the world. We do this through a network of Otis branch offices. We have over a thousand of those and each of those we conduct business locally. And there's a reason for that. One is because really elevators are the spine of the building. And if you think about it, without elevators, we couldn't have modern cities today. So we move on any given day, over two billion people touch our product. Wow, that's crazy. It, it, well, the population of the world's a little over seven billion, so in three or four days, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to touch the world and keep it moving safely. That's more people than fly. And so it's a tremendous life safety responsibility that I I know all of our colleagues really take seriously. Of our 68,000 colleagues, 33,000 are our mechanics who really live at our customers' facilities, who do multiple service visits and repairs as needed, really to keep cities moving, to keep buildings moving, to keep people safe and, and, and having access to, to their homes, to their residences, to hospitals. If you really think about movement, vertical movement, that's our specialty, and we've been doing it for 165 years. Now, we've been doing it fairly mechanically, Um, in the past. And the exciting part of our industrial business is now not only are we doing it mechanically, but there's so much involved in the electrical side, the data side of our business, because we understand movement in a building. And we understand what happens. We capture all that information. Every elevator has a, a controller on it. And that's really the future when you talk about the Internet of Things and having access to information so that we can serve all of our all of our stakeholders. First and foremost, I want all of those two billion passengers every day to be safe and get where they want to go. 
I, at the same time, I want every one of my employees to go home safe every night. Because if you think about the, the industry we are working in, especially in new construction or modification of older buildings, we need to ensure that everyone is going to be safe in the entire ecosystem there. And then lastly, we have people whose businesses and livelihoods depend upon vertical transportation. There are people who, who need our product and services and need it to be up. And so uptime is very important. So I know we'll have some time during this podcast to talk about the Internet of Things and the value of data analytics and the application of hopefully artificial intelligence to our dispatch algorithms. And these are exciting times in the vertical transportation industry and the elevator and escalator industry. And it's something you're right. Everyone assumes it's going to be there and it's going to be working. And that's fine with us. We want that assumption that it's going to be safe reliable and there for people every day at every hour when they need it. It's funny because a lot of people also don't think about how escalators and elevators have changed over the decades. Uh, because I'm sure when, uh, uh, you know, famously called the, the the people mover, everything used to be very manual. I think everything used to be made out of wood. Then we had the, the, the cables. I think some of that was also manual. And so today's elevators and escalators are pretty different than they were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so kind of a weird question. How have elevators and escalators, I mean, how have they changed? You mentioned like data, for example. So what are, what's the difference between the modern day elevator and escalator versus the ones of the past? Great question. The ones of the past were really designed based on ropes and pulleys. <laughs> it's, um, you know, gravitate, gravity and gravitational pull. And obviously, they're far more mechanized today. The, the, the value and the smoothness of the ride and ride performance is critical. The heights we take elevators to today are, are staggering, whether you're going to an observation deck at the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building of the world, whether you're going to the observation deck at the, at the Empire State Building or in, in Lotte Tower in Seoul, Korea or Willis Tower in Chicago. There's this excitement to be able to be part of a high-rise building and to have the expanse in front of you to see the world. To do that, we had to apply new technologies. We had to reach greater heights, and we did that mechanically, we did that electrically, and, and through information and data. And I think what a lot of people don't understand about elevators is they even generate power on their way down and actually put power back in the building. They're actually a distributed generation system for power. So, you know, they're energy efficient as well as, as just being that go-to technology. And then you think about escalators and the, how those have been uh, basically proliferated because of infrastructure growth across the globe. So metros, airports, you know, as the rising middle class has just demanded more access to travel, not just air travel, all travel. And, and we people have migrated back to cities and cities are dealing with transportation planning. There's been a great increase and improvement in infrastructure writ large, above ground, below ground. And the way you get there is elevators and escalators. And so those escalators actually move at much higher speeds. We call those public escalators versus the commercial escalators you see in a lot of retail facilities. And so they're two very different product sets for two very different needs. But the commonality is pretty, is pretty direct. Safely, rapidly move people from place to place. You also mentioned data. Uh, and of course, we're seeing a lot of uh, smart devices, smart elevators, smart escalators. Can you give us a sense of maybe what what information do you guys know or what information does an elevator or an escalator collect? Uh, because people that usually get on these things are probably just thinking, you know, what information could this thing possibly have? Uh, so yeah, what are you guys understanding there? Well, there's multiple sets of data. So I'll take you to a more standard elevator. And remember, we're still maintaining elevators that could be up to 100 years old. Uh, there's about 15, 15 and a half million elevators in use today that get maintained by ourselves and our competitors. But they really are ubiquitous, right? And they, they really do exist almost everywhere in the world. Um, but a typical standard elevator 
uh, the data you collect is everything from uh, door mechanism and door openings, uh, how many times, uh, how many floors it's been to, where it may have run into issues, self-diagnoses, error codes, fault codes, usage, runs, uh, weight that occur so you can assess how many people were in an elevator. All of that's pretty standard information and and uh, really as you think about the ability to use that it brings you to preventive and predictive maintenance in the future. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But the more exciting uh, in some of the elevators you probably see on the West Coast have something in them we call destination dispatch. And so these elevators for your for your podcast listeners, this is our Compass and Compass 360 product out of Otis. But in Destination Dispatch, you either personally enter your floor number and then you get told which elevator to go to. And then oh you yeah, can, I've seen those. Yeah, yep. or or in a more advanced state, actually be a, your iPhone or be a, your access credential, especially in a commercial building or an office building. When you, when you get past that first security checkpoint and you transmit the information and the credential that it's you, we know where you're going. We know where your office is. So then we send you to that elevator and that elevator can get you there far more effectively and efficiently. So when you start thinking about where buildings are going in the future and mobility in general is going in the future, I wouldn't say we're the last mile. We're the last floor. And so we bring people to that last destination they need to go to once they enter a building and we we have that we have all of that information today we have about 350,000 elevators connected and sending us that information every day wow. we're going to con- we're going to continue to expand that but beyond what that gives us for the specific elevator that we get the information from it gives us an incredible rich data set to be able to actually prevent and predict when any elevator in that family may be approaching uh, a period where they need some advanced uh, maintenance activity so that the elevator doesn't shut down. And our goal, and it's, it's very real, and we're offering this right now as a subscription service for certain customers, is we don't want you to call us to let us know you have a shutdown. We're actually going to call you in advance of it and tell you what we need to do for you so that you never have that shutdown. And that's what building managers want. The passengers want a safe, quick, predictable ride. The building operators, the people maintaining and managing buildings, they want minimal downtime. And the architects and the developers on the front end of these, the newest, latest, exciting new, you know, skyscrapers in the world, They want the latest features, the most data, and candidly, they want the fastest uh, elevators they can get that are optimized so that they know predictably they can build a building and not have to use any more space than they need to for the hoistway and the elevator, which then lets them have more rentable space or more space for every other use in the building as as they're dreaming and designing their new buildings. That's crazy. I mean, I I certainly never have thought about all those different types of data points that you guys collect. And I'm sure people listening to this have never even thought about it from that perspective either. Um, But you really, even just from kind of this up and down, you guys are collecting a lot of really interesting data about how pretty much how the world moves. Um, I never really thought about it that way. So that's uh, kind of a a different way for me to think about uh, elevators now. Uh, You also mentioned AI and the role that that might play in some of this, uh, I think, for your dispatchers. So what role does AI play in all of this? Our dispatch algorithms are really the, the heart of our software algorithms that assess where elevators should be, how they should move, how you respond to a normal request, how you respond in a time of distress or emergency. All of that is programmed into our dispatch algorithms that run on our uh, on our elevators. And, you know, the challenge and, and the excitement about the future is how do you create a le- learning algorithm that learns the heartbeat of the building as the building basically develops and as different, potentially different 
offices or different businesses or on different floors in mixed use buildings where you have retail, where you have people live residential. How do you how do you become a learning learning agent for that that algorithm? The algorithm itself is 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 incredibly complex. And yet I like to think of it as elegantly simple to assess when you send which car in a multi-car family of elevators where you need it to serve to serve people the best ai will help us learn that heartbeat it will help us learn as the building changes as the building grows you know when a building is built uh especially a brand new building there's an expectation. Uh, you go to a, a, a large high rise that's, uh, you know, an office complex, you know who the anchor tenant's going to be, but you don't know who all the other tenants are going to be. And, you know, you take the Empire State Building, for example, and, and you may have this vision of it being, you know, an older building with uh, a lot of law firms in it. And, you know, you think back in time, I will tell you multiple floors are now linked in have offices in there and you wouldn't recognize the inside of even some of our most iconic and, and older buildings. And so how the traffic patterns are, how the elevators get used, what happens at lunchtime when you know, you've got this demand signal driving elevators up and down more so than the morning rush and the afternoon rush for people to go home. All of that we have and, and as part of a standard elevator, the challenge with AI and I think the opportunity for AI is to be that learning, that learning heartbeat that lets us serve that better. Jacob, we have something we call OptiSense we rolled out this year, which is just a, is just a really neat application of existing technology being video analytics and, and our dispatch algorithm. And it quite simply, you install this in a hotel, convention center, um, sporting venue, and when the concert's over or the meeting breaks up, the, the camera on the outside of the elevator through video analytics senses the crowd and tells the dispatch, tells the algorithm, send every elevator down here so we can disperse the crowd quickly and not, not let someone on floor 12 or floor 8 stop an elevator for one person to go on when you've got a 100 or a 1,000 ready to go. And so there's lots of ways we can we can come up with some very unique applications. This one's, you know, the, everyone who sees it who's in that type of market is really excited because they get to use their current elevators, they install a camera and some extra video analytics software, and now they just have much happier, they have a better security situation, a better uh, health situation, and just happier passengers. And for us, Right now, the passengers, they're a stakeholder in our business, in buildings, but they're not a customer yet. And so we could see a day where passengers have the opportunity to become customers. We think we have to be far more passenger-centric because that's where we believe some of the new value-add offerings with data are going to be driven. You mentioned that you had, uh, what, like 35,000 of your employees who were mechanics, I think it was? Yeah, 33,000 globally. 33,000. Okay. And so I would imagine that for the mechanics in this space, uh, there's probably a lot of upskilling that needs to be happening as well, because it's not just kind of maintaining an elevator anymore. But I mean, you're basically a, a technology company that happens to make elevators. And so I'm curious what you're doing on the mechanic side to upskill employees, to teach them these new skills. Uh, I mean, what sort of programs, if any, do, do you have in place to help make that transition? We are an elevator company, first and foremost, that is aspiring to be a digital industrial company. And these mechanics are our are, are forward line, our forward family who are going to help us get there. So we owe them skills, upskilling, and we owe them technology to be able to do this. And fairly quickly and rapidly, we've been deploying to our mechanics iPhones with specially created apps to help them become more efficient, more effective, to be able to diagnose problems quicker, to be able to order parts while they're actually at the site because they have remote access through these iPhones, to be able to share amongst themselves to help each and every one of them upskill. We have a champions network where we have people who have volunteered proven mechanics to help skill others. 
but real time using using Yammer. Um, all of our mechanics are on Yammer and they're sharing real time lessons learned. They're sending out queries to each other, but we owe them via change management, via new processes, via tools. Um, we need to capture their institutional knowledge because they are domain experts across an entire line of over a hundred year old elevators, but we owe them new tools and technologies to tell them where to fault isolate and really candidly how to serve their customers better. When I meet a mechanic, he or she says to me, this is my building. And so that ownership is incredible. So they want to be able to serve their customers better. And we owe them that technology and the tools to do that. But when you do that, through a learning activity. Uh, so we put out these apps and we put them out, you know, we talk about minimally viable products so that we can put them out, see how they're accepted, see how they're embraced. And then the mechanics give us feedback on how to improve them. So we're right now, we're in a version 2.0 of our, of our applications for our mechanics and they're getting better every day. And so we're seeing it. The mechanics are less frustrated. The customers are happier. Uh, the, the elevators have better uptime, everyone's more productive, and in the end, to me, that's a win-win. Are the apps the main way that the mechanics uh, learn new skills? Well, it sounds like through through the apps, uh, they teach each other through the Yammer network, uh, but those seem like those are the two main ways that employees are able to upskill themselves. We have a variety of ways. We have a, a supervisor function that continues to do uh, both both in-person and digital chalk talks, if you will, on, on, on new technology as it's coming in terms of the elevator business. But we now have, have different methods to be able to introduce new product lines, to tell our mechanics you know, what, how, to, how to use that fault code and how to have visibility um, into you know, where a projected failure may occur so they can get there with the right part in enough time to have minimal downtime for the customer. Are you noticing any difference between older and younger workers? Uh, not necessarily, I, I suppose it could apply to mechanics, but I'm thinking just broadly across the company uh, between, for example, millennials or Gen Z or, or, or Gen X, uh, as far as how they work, whether they're mechanics or knowledge workers? Not so much how they work. Uh, I've seen every generation um, embrace technology at, in different in different ways, so I, I hate to I hate to kind of label one generation versus the other. What we've tried to to embrace is mentoring and reverse mentoring, both for our knowledge workers and for our mechanics, so that it works both ways. Uh, so we pair people up. So if, the, if a mechanic just has this institutional tribal knowledge, I don't know what else to call it, of how to how to make you know, make a door jam uh, work better, how to make the rollers work better because he's done it, he or she's done it so many times. We then pair him up and he has, he or she has the opportunity to, to learn the technology from someone who may have embraced it differently or be a little more digitally native. But I don't find that being as generational as, and, and as stereotypical as, as most people say. Uh, I'm probably one of the power Yammer users personally, and I'm, I'm certainly not a millennial. Uh, I, I have, I, I have a child who's a millennial. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think you'll find it's, it's people who want to embrace change and the technology enables it. And so we're going through a very large change management process across our enterprise. And I think across not just our industry, but most industries and those who, who see change as inherently positive and the ability to do things better and the ability to not have to do as administrative tasks as they used to, they embrace it and they've become our change agents. And the technology to me just assists and we've tried to really make it simple. But we're still, we're still always educating folks. What worries me, Jacob, is, you know, will we have enough, are there enough craft labor, skilled, skilled labor uh, mechanics, people in construction, people in the trades who want to pursue these careers globally. You know, with unemployment, you know, really decreasing in many parts, especially in Europe, um, you know, we really want people who want a career 
uh, in keeping buildings vibrant, in keeping people moving. And we want to embrace those folks as apprentices. We want to, we, we do significant apprenticeship development. And then we want them to have a career with us, whether they stay in the field in mechanic, in, as a mechanic or in sales, or they want to be part of, of a different part of the company inside of Otis. So, you know, we, I think the change is required because I think the workforce of the future um, is going to demand both. It's going to be multi-generational as well as they're going to, to demand the abilities and the access to technology. And so we're going through that transition and learning it as we go. Uh, are we making every step perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but we're, we're learning as we go and we're continuing to develop, you know, as a company and as a culture. And I think culture is important. And we're definitely going to talk about culture and leadership too. But you mentioned something interesting and you said that one of the things that you're worried about is making sure that you have enough of those types of workers in the future and people that basically want to build a career in that space. And uh, I know that that's something Mike Rowe, uh, he had a CNN show, Dirty Jobs. Uh, he talks a lot about that as well, that there are not that many people that are moving into that space. So I'm curious to get your perspectives on um the, the skills gap that some organizations are reporting, uh, what you're seeing, and what you're trying to do at Otis to help make sure that you do have those employees in the future or people that do want to go down that career path. We are embracing STEM from the time someone can actually speak. And to us, STEM really is the ability to appreciate and apply math and science in a variety of ways. Sometimes that's in a mechanical application where people just, you know, have a passion and an ability and want to work, uh, not work in an office, be at a, at a facility using tools, using technology, using their, their hands and their minds. So we start very early trying to encourage all children to stay in math and science. That doesn't mean everyone has to go get a four-year college degree. And so we believe there's an absolute great career, and we've proven it for 165 years for our workforce to be able to have a great livelihood, have a challenging position, and make a difference in moving people safely. And that's, you know, that's now become the culture. And we have generations of people. And I, I, I go into the, our branch offices, or I'll go to a site visit, and someone will say, you know, 11 of my brothers, uncles, fathers, mothers were all part of this industry. This is a proud industry of proud employees, and we owe them an environment where they can continue to add value. But you'll find it's, it gets kind of in your blood, and I didn't know this. Um, you know, I just joined Otis a year ago, but I can tell you the pride, the family feeling, and this the, in a life safety business – where you know that you're keeping everyone you care care about safe. It, there's something special about that. You know, we're in a regulated business for a lot of reasons, and the regulations are not the same in every part of the world. There's different codes we have to comply with, different safety agencies for all the right reasons, and that's so that we can keep the world moving. And, and that's what our employees take great pride in when they talk about their building or their elevator or, or their impact on not just the community they live in, but their, their families themselves. So we owe, you know, we continue to embrace that early. We drive apprenticeships everywhere we can so that people get the real-time experience, they get the educational experience they need, they get the certifications they need, and then we continue to embrace that throughout their careers. And I'm proud to say here at United Technologies, we have a, an employee scholar program that any employee who wants to go back and get a degree, we we sponsor it. We take care of it. We pay for it. We embrace it. And that's a pretty um, large but meaningful bill for us to pay. And, and we're proud to do it. And now let's take 90 seconds to hear from our sponsor, ServiceNow, and their chief talent officer, Pat Waters. 
Every company has an employee experience, those intentional and those organically created. For CHRO, you start by crafting your vision and you look at those moments that matter. They look at what is the business problem or opportunity they're trying to achieve, and they craft their talent strategies to not only achieve that goal, but actually to set themselves apart differentially in the marketplace to attract great talent. What I like to look at with my peers is how do you automate the processes that are repetitive? How do you create insights into tools and technology that allow me to think ahead, not two steps, maybe five steps? How do we create tools that create less friction for me as an employee that makes me free up opportunity and time to do things that I love to do? That is changing the way people do work. CHROs are helping redefine how talent works today. The benefits of intentionally crafting an employee experience is high. It's retention, it's engagement, it's better productivity, it's unlocking discretionary effort. So if you free up some of my time, you know, and I'm excited about my job and my work and collaborating, then I'm going to use that extra cycle to help others be successful. If you don't do that, you will lose that talent that you crafted for such a long time. The most successful CHROs today are looking around the corners, and I can't wait to see what they find. If you want to learn more, please visit servicenow.com forward slash HR. And now back to the podcast. Now that you're talking about that, that's actually a great transition into what I wanted to talk to you about next, which is what is it like to work at Otis? We talked a little bit about uh, the mechanics, but maybe in general, if somebody were to ask, you know, what is it like to work at Otis as far as uh, maybe a typical day for a mechanic or a typical day for a knowledge worker? Uh, what are the perks or benefits? What's the office design like, leadership style, anything that you want to share so that we can get that kind of auditory tour of what it's like to be an Otis employee. So if you're an Otis employee, of which we have many, um, the odds are you are somewhere in the, more often than not, in the field. And when I say in the field, it's because you're local. You're serving a community, a city, somewhere where you live primarily. And that could be, again, in any uh, in multiple countries, multiple cultures, our clock never stops at Otis. We were working every time zone. We we're supporting elevators, maintaining them all over the world. And, and we live a 24 hour clock. We have amazing, innovative engineers who do our research and development. We do that throughout the globe from Shanghai to Berlin, to Connecticut, to Cork, Ireland, to Spain, to, to France, um, to Korea, to Japan. So we have a great network of, of uh, knowledge workers. We have finance workers who make sure, our, our finance community, who make sure we're, we have controls, we understand you know, the, the, the actual operational backbone of, of all of our systems and everything we're doing. But a day in the life of Otis is typically a long day. <laughs> um, and the majority of our of our employees should be with customers. So we we challenge our employees for lots of independence, whether they're in sales or service, and we entrust them that they're going to represent themselves well, and more importantly, represent the company and the brand. And so what we did is we came up with um, five culture statements to represent who we are as a company. And these aren't, I would tell you, these are probably not typical. If you asked the leader of a company, tell me what, you know, tell me about your culture. So let me just list them for you and then I'm happy to discuss any of them. Number one, we celebrate imagination, which means we encourage new thinking and smart risk taking because we started the industry and we absolutely have to drive innovation forward. Number two, and this is that family, we believe in us. We empower and inspire each other through support, through autonomy, and through trust because everyone's primarily out in the field. Number three, we're many voices. The greatest ideas come from diverse teams of thinkers with different points of view. We are part of every culture, every country we're in. We are local. We look like the country we're in. We act like the country we're in, and we speak like the country we're in. Number four, we're better together. 
we align as one team and collaborate to serve our customers. And the last, we strive to be the best. We set big goals, we rise to achieve them, and we win together as a team. Those are our five culture statements. That's what makes Otis special in, an, in a business where so many of our employees operate autonomously almost every day. So this is the fabric that ties us together. It's trust and empower, it's diversity and inclusion for the best thoughts, the best ideas can come from any employee in our organization. And that's what we embrace and celebrate. I love those statements. I think they, they make a lot of sense. Um, and more organizations should have uh, sort of statements and actions that reflect that as well. Uh, I'm curious, though, for so you probably have what, like 30,000 plus employees who are, I suppose you would call them knowledge workers in, in offices. Is that right? So we have a thousand branch offices in those branch offices, which are all distributed. You'll find them in any city. Um, we have our sales force. We have um, all of our back office. We have supply chain again, because everything's local and we need to have our parts at the point of, of, of access for, for both our installation crews and our mechanics. Um, so we do have a tremendous amount of knowledge workers, but you won't find them uh, on huge campuses. Um, our headquarters are fairly small geographically. Uh, we have obviously our own manufacturing uh, locations throughout the globe um, where we basically manufacture major parts of the elevators and escalators. Now, interesting in our business, there's no final sell off in a factory. We don't like, we're not a mass producer because every elevator is a little unique. And every building is a little unique. So our final acceptance, the hoist way, all of the everything that gets aligned and adjusted happens at our customer location at 10,000 installations every day. It's really interesting because, I mean, most I'd say most company or probably every company I can think of, actually, um, when they especially large companies, they always have these massive campuses, right? A headquarters, 5,000, 10,000 employees are there. You know, you think of like Google or Facebook, but it sounds like you are just so distributed, which I think is a very unique model. I can't think of many companies that operate like that. And so you mentioned autonomy a few times. So these 1,000 offices are kind of, I guess there's a lot of trust involved making sure that they are servicing their customers in the best way. Um, it's not like, so, is somebody constantly overseeing that or how does that work? You have to trust these offices. So the branch manager or the general manager, there are days, actually there are more than some days that I believe they have the best job in Erdos. They control and make decisions every day on where to send a technician, a mechanic, how to solve a problem, how to get a proposal in for new, for new scope, how to deal with uh, competitive bids for new buildings, how to bill, how to collect cash. They, they own a mini business. Now, we're not a franchise. These are our people, and, and we train them. We develop them. They grow up, a lot of them, through the business. They start as trainees, out as a lot of them out of universities, and they just have a great opportunity to run their small business. And then we aggregate those thousand, obviously through regions and then all the way up through our global headquarters. And I have to be clear, I love those other big campuses. They're great customers of ours. And we love th those campuses. Um, they're great opportunities for us. That's just not our business model. We are a field service company where everything is done locally, except where we try to optimize for scale. And we optimize for scale, obviously, on purchasing and supply chain. We optimize for scale with, you know, one ERP so that we can manage effectively. We optimize for scale with a common set of ethics and business conduct and won't accept any deviations to that, especially throughout the world. We do business the right way every time. So that the balance of what we can do globally and especially with these new technology platforms, with the ability to synthesize data more than at one, lo one branch, but the ability for us to understand how elevators are operating, can operate, and get to transparent, preventive, and predictive, 
That's huge for us. And that's, that's where the global strength comes in. It's a global R&D organization. And yet we have engineers at all of our factories to be able to make things custom as cu- customers need. We have to respond if a, if a metro wants a, a certain size and shape based on how they've designed um, you know, the hoistway in an airport or in a building or in a hospital or in a school or in a church. Um, or, you know, uh, you know, slanted like the Eiffel Tower that we've been in since the time it was open or the Luxor Hotel. Um, we have to be able to do things custom because that's, that's the business we're in. And then we have to service those really for the life of the elevator. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing the amount of customization that you guys are, uh, are doing over there. Uh, I had a couple of questions that uh, people online wanted me to ask you, but before I jump into those, I'm actually curious, uh, what's a typical day like for you? <laughs> uh, I don't think I've had two of the same days in the year I've been here. So uh, it starts early, as you can imagine, uh, as, as our Asia Pacific and especially our China business uh, businesses are ending their days. Um, China is the single largest market right now for elevators and escalators, uh, an, a, an order of 10 magnitude over the next largest market, which is India for new equipment. Wow. It's just, it's been a tremendous building boom. And even with the current controls and, and constraints, China's still growing and we're growing there too. We were there early and, and we, we've, uh, we've been successful there, obviously dealing with, with significant growth levels and now a little bit of curbing uh, on, that, on the real estate bubble. So uh, the mornings start early, very early, uh, no matter where I am in the world because we're a 24-hour business. I would tell you I try to balance the day. Um, a day doesn't go by where I won't hear from a customer pretty much. Um, and those are ones that I take um, immediate action on because, you know, we have lots of customers, as you can imagine, servicing two million elevators uh, all the time. But when, when a customer feels frustrated enough to reach out to me, I, I like to make sure that, that they're listened to and that we address it immediately. And, you know, in today's world, you can get inquiries for new business or customers through so many channels. What I get on LinkedIn is, is amazing to hear, you know, people reach out and, and people figure out it's easy to find you, to get your email address. And I welcome that. From that same standpoint, I welcome employees reaching out. And I try to find time in a day, whether it's walk around management, uh, whether it's our Otis University, which happens to be on our Connecticut campus this week before they go to Berlin next week uh, for some of our future leaders, just find time to, to be with the employees, to share where we're going, to share the opportunities, to share the challenges, and most importantly, to listen to them and understand um, you know, what's happening in their region of the world. What trends are they seeing? You can't sit at a headquarters in this kind of business and monitor every geopolitical, every macroeconomic trend. It's all done locally. And that's why these branch managers are so empowered. So I try to get some time with employees uh, and obviously try to focus on partnerships and alliances with other companies. If you think about the future of mobility writ large, we at Otis think we have a big play in it. And we think we are a key element of that ecosystem. And that's we're just one of many players. So figuring out what our future looks like um, in the new digital economy, in, in the continued growth of cities, in the world of autonomy, um, all of those challenges, and then operationally running the business. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, about a $12.5 billion business. Um, and so it's, it's everything from tactics to strategy and, uh, and the nights usually end fairly late. The, the only challenge I have is trying not to go back to Asia and China at night or you'll never sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine 200 countries, it's probably, uh, um, it's easy to stay awake nonstop. Uh, what are some of the big trends that you're paying attention to? So there's there's a quite a few big trends. Clearly, um, you know, macroeconomic and geopolitical trends and the the trade war are are you know pretty close close in. Uh, we manufacture locally too, so you know it for us it makes sense 
to be closest to the point of delivery so that we can do the installations uh, in a logical way and a cost-effective way. So our manufacturing network is fairly dispersed. We have one manufacturing enterprise uh, in the U.S. in uh, Florence, South Carolina, um, but then we have plants that range from Brazil to Russia to clearly multiple in China, um, as well as, as many multiple in Europe. So we're trying to balance everything from uh, currency swings and how you deal with that to, to tariffs. And, you know, we use a lot of steel, as you can imagine, in the hoist way. So that was the first challenge earlier this year. And we do import certain parts of our products from our China factories, limited, but some into the Americas, because high rises today, the majority of them are not being built in quantity in the United States. They're being built in Asia. They're being built in the Middle East. And so, you know, we've located our network where it can serve us best. So that's something that's top of mind. I think any business leader would tell you that, but certainly any global business leader that's doing business in that many countries would tell you there's no way not to be concerned about that. From a technology standpoint, I'm excited. I, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering where you know autonomous vehicles are going and what does that mean for vertical transportation? I'm wondering what um, the passenger I'm not, I wouldn't even call it the passenger of the future. Today's passenger, if I can think of value-add services for them and how data will enable that, as well as um, lots of interesting transmission, both inside our, an elevator and other places, that's exciting. I believe that artificial intelligence and bots will continue to help us provide a better product and provide productivity and efficiencies, candidly. And um, and I you know and I'm I really do focus on the workforce of the future. How do we how do we prepare the people we have to take to be with us in the journey? And then most importantly, what does what do, what do the future roles look like? And once you can envision that, then you can start redefining your business processes to align to that. So you need a vision for the company a vision of what the future workforce looks like. And that's when the change management comes in to say, okay, now what are the processes, tools, and techniques I need to change so that we don't consider, t we don't continue to do business the same way. Every business today is being challenged. Every business is being disrupted. Our business will be disrupted if it hasn't already. I can't tell you whether that will be through the current incumbent competition or through new entrants. But my, my continuous message to, to our 68,000 colleagues is we need to disrupt ourselves. We need to think through what that could look like to this iconic industrial, and we need to get there ourselves. And will it potentially cannibalize some of our business? It may, but it will posture us for the next multiple decades to come. The last thing I wanted to ask you before I jump into some of the other questions that people had for you. Uh, was about leadership, because I realized that's one of the things that we didn't talk about. And I know you're also super interested and passionate about that. Uh, what role do you think leadership plays in a lot of the things that you guys are doing? And, and what is Otis as an organization doing to make sure that you have the right leaders in place that encourage upskilling, that in, embrace these uh, the, the culture statements that you had? How do you put those right leaders in positions of power? Well, Great question. Um, hopefully, they're not in positions of power. Um, and, and I'm just taking a little a little license with your word. You know, in a distributed organization, you need information sharing, you need collaboration, you need trust, and you need the ability for people um, to to be able to make decisions, make them right on ethics and integrity. In the business perspective, make them right more than wrong. Um, but at least give them that authority and autonomy. That takes development. That takes experience, but it takes development. So we have leadership development courses. We continue to promote from within significantly. Uh, many of our leaders move around geographically um, in different parts of the country they're in or in different countries, so they get a truly global multicultural experience because that's the way you appreciate how this enterprise goes to market and succeeds. And then uh, we've just 
put together something we call Culture U, uh, which is our culture university for, for leaders, that is to help elaborate these culture statements, provide that candid 360 feedback to talk about our values and our behaviors and our mindset, and most importantly, to drive change management. This company wouldn't still be here if it didn't evolve and change. What I'm trying to challenge our leaders to today is with the digital economy we're in, with the technology that's available already and will continue to not just evolve, but technology we can't even predict, we can't just evolve. Yes, physical buildings will be around for a long time, which is a great opportunity for us, but we can't just evolve. We have to lead, we have to disrupt, and our leaders need to be thought leaders. And they need to sit in their customer's shoes, sit in the passenger's shoes, and it, because we're all passengers and customers ourselves, and assess what more can we do to drive value in every, in our, every element of our enterprise, from our people, to our product, to our service offering. I love it. Uh, well, I have so many more questions I can ask you, but I feel like uh, I should ask you some of the questions that people wanted from LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'll jump into these uh, right away. The first one is from Susan, and she asks, what do you see as the biggest gap in skills for AI and uh, digital technology competence? And as a follow-up to that, she says, what skills do you feel are the most important for people to effectively work at the intersection of technology and being human? On the first question, can, can you repeat? You know, can you repeat that one just one more time? Yeah. So the first part was, what do you see as the biggest gap in skills for AI and digital technology competence? The gap to me is not in the data science of it. It's not in the, the architecture of it. The gap today is in the application. How do you take the incredible tools that are available, the, 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 the art of the possible, the technology of the possible, and reduce that to an application that adds value? That's what, what we seem to be missing, and that's where I believe you will see the development of actually different, a different career path for people who have that ability to be able to make that application and reduce that to practice. And the second part to that was, what skills are most important for people to effectively work at the intersection of technology and human beings? To me, it's collaboration. It's the ability to apply, but more importantly, motivate, explain what you're doing, and, and actually bring a team of people together to achieve an objective. The technology supports that, but it's all about having a common objective and the collaboration activity to get there. Next question is from Nick uh, Briere. I think that's how you say your last name, Nick. Uh, and he says, I would love to hear from Judy what opportunities and resources we should be providing or advancing for the youth of today to ensure the dynamic workforce of tomorrow. I would love to see the spirit of exploration, the spirit of experimentation, all the basics and the fundamentals of problem solving. If you want to teach teach skills, independently teach the, the workforce of the future how to solve problems and let them then figure out the venues, how to do it. But, but you know, one of the things I learned in engineering school uh, was with enough time, you could solve any problem. And so that to me is the value, regardless of where we go as a society, regardless of where technology develops, the ability to understand a problem and solve it would be tremendous. Next question is from Priyanka Komala. Um, well, the first part of her question, I think we already touched on with Susan's question, but she had a second part, which is um, from a cultural transformation standpoint, what are some of the skills or what do we need to do to help ensure that staff understand that humans and AI complement each other and that it's not so much about AI and technology that's going to be replacing humans? So how do you 
convince people of that? How do you teach people that? Because there's a lot of fear out there, as I'm sure you, uh, you notice as well. When you and I spoke um, the first time, we talked about um, people plus technology. We talked about humans and technology and AI. It, to me, it's not an either or. I think we need some great success stories. And they can be early success stories. But we need to, instead of being afraid of technology, we need to show where humans and technology aligned and working together make a difference. And those stories exist. They exist at Otis. Happy to share those. I think they exist in so many places in today's automated world, in manufacturing, in retail, in, in almost every service industry. So we need to stop talking about either or and talking about and and plus. And because I do believe there are roles for both in the future, we're going to need to define those roles. I think it's going to make the human role actually far more interesting and more challenging. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and last question for you before I ask you just a few rapid fire fun questions. Um, and this one is, is for me because I know you, uh, I think you wrote an article on LinkedIn about this as well. But how do you convince others to change? I get this question a lot, whether it comes to technology or culture or whatever it might be. People are always saying, you know, I get it, I believe it, but maybe my manager doesn't. How do I convince leaders inside of my organization to believe in X or to move towards Y? How do you get people to see your perspective? You share your perspective and you share the value that can be extracted from that. And that value doesn't have to be monetary. It can be a small victory and a small value to you or to someone you share that value with. I believe change is inherently positive. I have believed that my entire career and, and have lived through so much change that to me, it, I don't even question it anymore. I just expect the next day to bring change and embrace it and move forward. And as long as, as you can show that and lead that way and people, people will, they will come on board. They may not come full hearted or full throated, but when they start extracting value from it and seeing the importance of it, you know, we, we would be in such a different place if we didn't change. And that has nothing to do with technology. That's just about being people and leaders have a responsibility to help people through this and to recognize that not everyone uh, is as comfortable with it. So you need to create some small victories and you need to be able to create an environment where people feel a little safe as they're going through this change. Perfect. Uh, all right, and last uh, couple series of rapid fire fun questions for you. Uh, first one, what do you think has been your greatest business failure? I don't think you have enough time for my list. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or it could be mistake. Yeah, Failure how, or mistake. Uh, very simply, I, at one point in my career, um, believed in a business plan when I knew better. And I let it uh, get the best of me in an organization I was leading. And the organization failed. And it was absolutely my responsibility. And I knew better. I knew inherently we were trying to take on a, a, com a, comp a competitor who was deeply rooted and had every ability to, to outlast us and outmaneuver us. And uh, we were not successful. And that's my responsibility. Wow. Um, what's your most embarrassing moment at work? Wow. I know this is supposed to be rapid fire. I'm trying to think of them. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe, maybe you just don't have any embarrassing moments. Oh, I'm sure I have plenty. Um, most embarrassing moment. Um, I'll have to come back on that one. Okay. Uh, what are you most proud of? Oh, I'm proud of the Otis family. Um, I'm, I am just so excited and proud and happy to, to have the, the opportunity to be part of this great company and to lead it in the future. But I am proud of, of her colleagues and the work we do that, as you said, when we started this discussion, so many people aren't aware of or just take for granted. 
you know, we are part of the infrastructure of this of this world, and we we take that responsibility so seriously. And yet, when you move outside and you have the opportunity to meet our colleagues, they are incredible humans. They they are part of their communities. They love to volunteer, and they love the industry they're part of. And that's that's what I'm proud of. What is your favorite business or non-business book? Hmm. Well, not the one I'm reading now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, struggling through the Da Vinci biography right now. Um, that, which sounds, is, that, that sounds intense. It is, it is, it's about 750 plus pages of intense, um, but it's fascinating to see what happened in the late, you know, late 15th century in Italy. And so, so I, I, I haven't stopped, but I'm struggling. Um, well, I won't give you, I won't give you one of our Otis books. We have a whole, a whole group on the history of the company and, and, and the elevator industry. Um, I'll, I'll ping you with it. I've got a whole group and I, I, I alternate between, you know, which ones I recommend to folks. Um, I'll, 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 I'll ping it to you. I promise. All right. And the last two for you, uh, who's the best mentor you've ever had? You don't necessarily need to give a name if you don't want to, but, um, is there somebody during the course of your career that really, uh, was a great mentor to you and, and what did they do? So, yeah, we, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of d discussion now between mentorship and sponsorship and, and we're really endorsing sponsorship to keep moving ahead and, and people actually taking a very active role, um, in, in your career and giving you opportunities. I was very fortunate to experience sponsorship before it was even known as that, I think, Um, and I had people who every time I thought they, they wanted me to take on more responsibility and I, I knew in my heart, I, I didn't know everything about the role and, and it was a, a high risk. They, they had my back and, and I took it every time and I grew through it and learned from mistakes, but they had my back. And I think that's probably the, the most important piece, whether it's visible or not, that someone knows And you can see in someone the, the, the skills, the abilities, the characteristics, and the integrity to be able to succeed. And you help watch them grow. And, you know, I'm at the stage in my life where I actually thoroughly enjoy being on the other side now, helping others grow and develop. And that's, that'll be more of a legacy I leave than um, I believe any financial metrics or, or anything else. It's, it's the people who that you've helped develop and grow and, and let them, let them continue to take on more responsibilities and become better people. And very last question for you. If you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? Whatever it would be, it would be highly customer involved. I can assure you of that and highly people engaged. Um, I'm in a perfect career for someone who probably has a short attention span, who's extremely impatient, and who loves change. So <laughs> those, those would be the attributes of whatever that career would be. And I, I just have to think about where that would align better um, or, or would align for my, either my next chapter or a chapter I didn't have. So those are the attributes of who I am, and, and that's who I've been forever. And that's who I will be forever. I, I recognize that won't change. So, you know, is that, is that a teacher, a professor, maybe? Um, is that something of that nature, potentially? Um, but but I, that, those are the attributes. All right. Well, those were all the questions. You're going to have to get back to me on the uh, embarrassing moment and your favorite book question. We're going to hold you to those. Oh, you, you'll have them before the end of your day. All right. Well, Judy, where can people go to learn more about you and Otis? I know you're also a LinkedIn influencer, so you publish articles on there. But anything you want to mention, please uh, feel free to do so. Yeah, so I'm, I welcome um, the followers and the connections on LinkedIn. I think it's a great Um, a great platform to exchange information. And I love watching it to be able to see even inside our Otis network to be able to, to watch the world 
in terms of, of what we're, you know, the world we're impacting. Um, I can be reached at judy.marks at otis.com. Uh, that's my email, and uh, and I do read all my emails. And uh, obviously, I'm on Twitter and, and other platforms as well. But if you want to know more about Otis, it's really simple, www.otis.com. And we're proud of who we are. And I hope I hope those who listen enjoy enjoy going through going to our site and learning more about us. Absolutely. And, and next time you get into an elevator, hopefully you'll look at it a little bit differently. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I believe everyone will. Uh, yeah. Well, Judy, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. You bet. Thanks, thanks Jacob. My pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for joining. A guest, again, my again, uh, oh, man, I can't even speak. Again, my guest has been Judy Marks, president at Otis Elevator Company. I will see all of you next week.